Hello, I'm Dr. Merritt Andrus. I'll be your instructor here for Chemistry 351 this semester. This is an introduction to the course going over the syllabus and a little introduction to organic chemistry in general we'd like to present to you today. Uh, we'll go over the syllabus and go through this material. As you can see here, uh, class is at nine in the morning. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and on Thursdays we have the recitations at different times. There's my contact info and the TA's name and email addresses. You'll get to know them very well. The materials is uh, the ebook, the sixth edition of Smith, Organic Chemistry with Biological Topics. You access it through the red shelf button at the top of the learning suite uh, toolbar. Uh, the ebook is the recommended thing, but you can also opt out of that if you choose to get it uh, somewhere else. Homework problems are assigned, you can see here. Uh, we'll have 15 of those assignments. They're homework problems that are at the end of the chapters, and you'll see those numbers here in a second. You uh, do it by hand, and then you upload a uh, copy electronically to the Learning Suite site before the uh, deadline for that. There's another homework assignment called the Homework Book Challenge, uh, which is your solutions to all of the even problems located at the end of each chapters that are assigned. Chapters 1 through 12, A, B, uh, and C, which are the spectroscopy chapters, and 21, uh, the free radical chapters. This homework book challenge is not graded. Uh, if you turn it in and you're found at the end of the course to be in a borderline grade, three to five raw points away from the next grade up, if I can see your homework book challenge notebook done there, we will give you that next grade up. Quizzes, uh, some will be unannounced pop type quizzes in class, always on material we've covered in a previous class time, or sometimes we'll do take home type quizzes. So we'll let you know about that. They'll be posted on Learning Suite or I'll uh, mention it in class so you'll be able to deal with it. If they are take-home quizzes, you'll upload it uh, to Learning Suite similar to the uh, homework there. Pop quizzes are done by hand just right in class. Exams, yes, four midterms and a final. The midterms are all in the testing center. The final is at the university uh, scheduled time, which will be at the end there, December 14th. Worksheet, I have some extra problems, some harder problems from old exams you can find also on uh, Learning Suite. And that's where you need to go for everything. Everything's contained on Learning Suite there. Here are the assigned uh, homework problems that need to be done at the uh, times, and you'll see the schedule here in a second. They're end of chapter problems, they're uh, odd problems, and uh, yeah, the, you can find them there at the end of the chapters. Also the ebook on Red Shelf, we also have the uh, electronic uh, study guide and, and uh, solution manual to all these problems. I need to see your work, how you solve these problems. You can't just copy what's in the solution manual and get full credit. We need to see how you solve these problems. Anyway, these are also listed on Learning Suite and a couple other places. I have the syllabus and the um, schedule and a separate file also under uh, uh, content uh, materials on Learning Suite there. Due dates you'll see on the schedule here in a second. Make sure when you do your work, just lay it out and snap a picture of it. Convert that file into a PDF or a GIF. Don't just use your iPhone uh, file. That's an HEIC file. It's not compatible with Learning Suite. So make sure you switch your document into um, one of those uh, accepted file types. Here's the breakdown on the grades. You have the four exams, 400 points. The final is uh, 200 points. Uh, homework, yeah, we dropped two of those. Yeah, and quizzes, we drop one also. So out of those points, these grade cutoffs are just approximate right now. You guys create the curve in the class depending on your point distribution. My goal is to give everybody an A, and if you're all bunched up there uh, with high uh, scores, I'll, I'll give you A's, but there's always a distribution of points and that's roughly how it breaks down. Again, I look for uh, grade cutoffs that are fair, I think, where there aren't many points and I'll describe that at the end of the 
course, you don't need to worry about that now. Uh, everything's on Learning Suite, like I said. Uh, when we hand back pop quizzes and exams, there's a display case with alphabetized slots under it in the hallway there by W111. Uh, uh, so class, yeah, you need to come because we go over the material, of course, and work the problems for your benefit. We'll do some small group exercises as well. So please come prepared, read ahead, take notes, and, and uh, ask questions. Um, you must understand and follow all of the uh, COVID requirements, and I think you've seen that before. Uh, wearing mask in uh, in class if you can't be six feet apart. Um, yeah, and all the other stuff there, I think. Okay, service of schedule, it's quite detailed. Again, there's a PDF copy of this in uh, Learning Suite, and there's also the electronic version of this, which is in Learning Suite. So day to day, you can always see what topic we're covering and then when things are due. So you see the topics going by here and you see the due dates for the homework assignments and the quizzes and the tests. Here you see exam one, which will be uh, uh, over chapters one through four. So you see the topics there and there's the reading. So you can stay ahead of me in class and do the reading carefully there. Testing center, you know, Friday through Monday, and I'll, of course, remind you of this in class, but you can always see what's coming up there. And topic-wise, you know, we're going over some basic fundamental topics of uh, structure, bonding, uh, hybridization, acid-base, different functional groups, and alkanes, the first general topic that relates to organic chemistry, which is, of course, the study of carbon base compounds. But then we'll get quickly into reactions you see here and alkyl halides and alcohol. So we'll get into functional groups uh, quite quickly. At first, it's kind of a review of a lot of topics in general chemistry. Uh, so hopefully you did well in that and can review those topics and stay up on that material. But uh, initially on here, even though some of these topics carry over from general chemistry, we'll be using examples and working problems that relate to organic chemistry. So you'll see how things uh, will change quite quickly there. But uh, yeah, and then exam two here over the next set of uh, chapters. Exam uh, three over some next ones. We'll do things a little bit out of order here. I'll put dienes, chapter 12, along with alkenes and alkynes. So that will be that next grouping there. And then oxidation reduction reactions will be uh, part of the last exam uh, four there. So that's chapter 11. Sorry, it's a little out of order. And then the spectroscopy chapters A, B, C, uh, and C. And then we'll have radicals, which is chapter 21, which is a little bit uh, further ahead there, but you see that. And then the final, December uh, 14th, which will be, sorry about that, 7 a.m. at the scheduled time in the Benson W111. So it's just more detail on the homework assignments, how they're uh, done, I've already described that. And the quizzes, that schedule, you can see those due dates here along the right side of the uh, schedule there. Uh, and then the uh, homework book challenge, yeah, that's due only at the end of the semester. And again, that's only if you're found in a borderline grade, right? So I look for cutoffs where there aren't many scores. That's where I put the grade cutoffs. If you're found in one of those regions, you see, if I see your homework book challenge, I can uh, give you the next grade up. But that's all the solutions to uh, the even problems at the end of all the chapters. These are the assigned problems, right? They're very specific. So there's always uh, seven or eight of them, and you can see them there for chapter one. It's 41, 45, 51, etc. You need to do those by hand and then upload that uh, as a single file, not an HEIC file but a, a, a GIF or a TIFF that, that's compatible with Learning Suite that we can see there. So there's 15 of, of those assignments there. Well, very good. Um, so yeah, how do you uh, succeed in organic chemistry? So the line in the Bible is a rich man can't get into heaven. Uh, it's easier for a rich man to get into heaven than a, a camel to get through the eye of a needle, right? So here's a blow up of the needle. So it's easier for that rich man to get in heaven or for you to get an A in this class. So. Yeah, and that's the feeling, right? This is an intimidating class and there's a lot of material here to cover and organic chemistry has a well-deserved uh, reputation as being difficult that way. But if you do these things and focus on the principles and understand structure and reactivity and mechanism, 
uh, you can uh, get this camel through the eye of the needle there. But you need to read ahead, right? You need to be careful about focusing on the principles, not just trying to memorize everything, but use the principles to help you understand the material. Work the problems without looking at the solution manual right away. Struggle with the problems if you need to. Try to pinpoint your lack of understanding and find what you need to review and get help right away, okay? Don't let things fester for a long time, but understand and try to identify exactly where you might be missing some understanding and get help to address that right away. So we have uh, exam reviews. Of course, we have recitation sections. I have office hours, and you need to come and, and get help. So participate in a study group, too. You guys can get together. I won't require that, but informally, I hope you get together. Make things like outlines and flashcards. Use models. Those aren't required, but from time to time, I will uh, have handheld models in class and help you with that. That can be an important tool if you struggle with seeing things in three dimensions. Organic compounds can be quite complex, and in three dimensions, stereochemistry can be uh, an issue there. Well, the big question is, uh, why organic chemistry? Chemistry based on carbon. That's just one out of over 100 different elements in the periodic table, right? Why are so many compounds and so many processes based on organic compounds? Uh, and why are you taking this class? So those are the two big questions. Why carbon and why are you in this class? Well, we want to improve and develop new processes, develop new materials, new drugs, new applications, understand how things work in biological systems, and understand all aspects of that. Yeah, it creates uh, new products, new affluence for society, and yeah, making some money off of it is also an important thing. But also satisfying curiosity, knowing how each compound works, its structure, how it reacts, and the mechanism by how it reacts. Those are important things. Understanding the minute details of, uh, of compounds and how they work, and understanding the big picture, how it fits in there. And also cleaning up and preventing messes, right? That's more of a political and a public issue uh, that uh, organic chemists also address. So I'll go through a few slides here and show you some specific compounds. You're probably familiar with some other ones that you might, uh, might uh, prefer, but all science starts as a matter of size. So here we're talking about very small molecules, right? 10 to the minus 10 meters. These are nanometer angstrom dimension materials, very tiny, even compared to microorganisms that you can only see with a microscope, right? So single cells are already very tiny. These are all dominated by electrical forces here. If you get down to the subatomic particles and atoms, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons, those are even tinier particles which involve nuclear forces. We won't talk about that. Here in OCHEM, we're mainly talking about electrical forces, sharing electrons, covalent bonding, and also electrostatic interactions with ionic compounds. But here's the molecule uh, Taxol. You'll see it in a minute. But that's a fantastically potent anti-cancer compound, which is very tiny, which affects something many orders of magnitude larger, like a person, if they have that disease. And then we get the much larger things, you know, the solar system, the Earth, the, the galaxy, whatever. Super huge dimensions there, where gravity is the main force that affects things there. We're studying mainly here uh, uh, molecules that are, that are very small dimensions there. So again, why carbon? So maybe you've thought about that from Gen Chem and, and thought, well, why do I have to take an organic chemistry class? Well, actually two classes, right? 351 and 352. We'll use the same ebook for 352, but it's still a continuation of a discussion of the properties, uh, the structure, reactivity, and mechanisms of organic compounds, right? So here's carbon, which is in the Second row of the uh, periodic table, the fourth uh, group over there, element number six. So because it's four over there, it has four valence electrons. We'll review that the first day, the periodic table, and thinking about that. But with those four valence electrons, it means it has a valency of four. It can form four covalent bonds. To have an equal grouping of eight electrons around it in the stable state, the so-called octet rule being satisfied. 
We'll start with these Lewis dot structures to get a basic understanding of uh, structure there. You look at some other elements like oxygen, well that has six valence electrons. So it can form two bonds and leaves behind two lone pairs on its stable structure. Uh, that's a difference of uh, oxygen versus carbon, which has four bonds, oxygen typically two bonds, okay? Nitrogen has five valence electrons, so it forms three covalent bonds and leaves behind one lone pair. So you can already see some structure uh, differences there and the uniqueness of carbon having this stable grouping of eight electrons around it with no lone pairs and no empty uh, orbitals at that point. Hydrogen with just one electron, it's the first element, right? So it's just uh, monovalent, just with the one covalent bond. Carbon has further complexity to it in that we say it can hybridize depending on how many groups are bonded to it. We can have four groups bonded and have tetrahedral arrangement, a three-dimensional arrangement, which is sp3 hybridized. All the atomic orbitals in that second row are mixed together to create four equivalent sp3 orbitals that are involved in the bonding. Now, if a carbon, uh, central carbon is bonded to just three other elements, we say it's sp2 hybridized, and we have a double bond capability to another element there. That becomes trigonal planar in that there's just three things bonded to that. So that's a two-dimensional position within a molecule. And that's an alkene or a double bond, and we'll have a specific topics uh, about that. If it's bonded to just two things here, we have a triple bond, that's SP hybridization, and that's a digonal or a linear arrangement, which is one dimensionality. So in SP2 hybridization, we have a leftover P atomic orbital that's not hybridized, and that's involved in the so-called pi bond that maybe you've heard about. So a double bond's a pi bond and a sigma bond together. Now those things will hopefully make more sense. We'll go through it systematically in chapter one. But this just gives you a little heads up of the versatility of carbon there and different varieties of bonding. Now, because it's that stable tetrahedral arrangement, we can have chains, long extended chains of hydrocarbons, or we can have rings like cyclohexane there, uh, which could actually pucker into a chair cyclohexane that maybe you've heard about. We can have functional groups like an alkene I just mentioned with the sp2 uh, bonding to be a uh, double bond there. Or we can have a double bond to another atom like oxygen here and have a so-called carbonyl compound. Now when we look at actual drugs, something that you're probably familiar with penicillin, at least the name, maybe not the structure, there's a lot of functional groups in here and this covalent bonding has a specific shape in how those electrons and those atoms are involved in bonding. It actually has a little four-membered uh, beta-lactam cyclic amide structure carboxylic acid, a sulfide, and an amide, and an aromatic uh, group on the end. And here's the uh, space filling uh, model for it. So those things can get quite complex quite quickly when we have multiple functional groups. But again, that's versatility of carbon allowing for that. Now we have a lot of materials that we can create in organic chemistry. One of the main starting materials is uh, petroleum, which is pumped out of the ground, or crude oil. We can thermally crack that into different smaller molecules here. This polymer X here, there's hundreds of, of uh, repeating units here with this long chain. That can be converted into something as simple as ethylene gas, which is just C2H4 with a simple double bond between the two carbons. That can be converted into a host of different materials that go into building materials, pharmaceuticals, and a lot of other things that I'll show you here in a second. So this is just highlighting some of the possible functional groups and the known pathways in industry for converting that into useful products. Other materials like polymers, maybe you've heard of polyvinyl chloride or polystyrene in there. The natural one is uh, polyglucose, cellulose, uh, which has a specific repeating uh, arrangement here of different glucose monomeric structures, and they're linked together covalently to make cellulose, which is the woody fibers in all plants. Here's some fuel molecules, simple ones like uh, natural gas or methane, and then the isooctane, the high octane fuel additive. Uh, simple octane, straight chain octane, is a, a different structure. It's an isomer of isooctane. 
and MTBE. I'm not going to specify or talk about each specific thing, but organic compounds can be made into highly conductive materials for display screens and data storage and liquid crystals and all the panel display screens here, even on my computer. These are <laughs> Uh, liquid crystals or light emitting diodes based on organic compounds that change color based on small, weak uh, electrical fields that they come in contact with. So all the fantastic electronic materials that we use today, a lot of them are based on not conducting wire type molecules uh, like copper or silver, but but on these uh, uh, softer organic compounds like polyacetylene, which has a metallic sheen to it. It conducts electricity very well like a copper or a silver wire, but, but uh, it's actually an organic compound, polyacetylene, and some others there. Dyes and sensors, they can change colors to paste, depending on what environment they're found on, either in the presence of light can change colors, or in the presence of a, a metal cation can change uh, colors there. Flavors and fragrances, you've probably heard of some of those. I won't uh, get into all of that. We have the... Uh, artificial sweetener aspartame and the natural sweetener stevia and the uh, red hot chili pepper compound capsaicin that you've probably uh, heard of there. But yeah, many hundreds of thousands of compounds are known in that area, flavors, fragrances. Herbicides and pesticides, yeah, that helped agriculture and different uh, industries there. Some have been outlawed actually, DDT. The natural ones are more common now, chrysanthemic acid and limonene to uh, repel insects. Uh, yeah, there's a number of things there. Drugs, uh, here's just a sampling of some of the very common ones. You've probably taken some of these, penicillin, aspirin, sulfa drugs. Uh, probably a derivative of morphine, cocaine. Yeah, hopefully you haven't taken all these specific compounds. But uh, lidocaine and procaine in the uh, dentist chair, uh, the local anesthetic agent, is based on the structure of cocaine. Uh, methamphetamine, there's a number of drugs based on that structure, Prozac. Some of the anti-cancer compounds, there's Taxol, the one I showed you the structure before. Very complicated, a lot of functional groups that we'll uh, be getting into. We will point out some specific drugs and highlight uh, some of their activity as they relate to the properties and the fundamentals we'll cover in class. Now, structure complexity. So we have, you know, lines and bonding. You've seen some things going on here. Each line represents two electrons. In each corner end uh, is a carbon atom. We don't always draw all the atoms explicitly, but we have the basic structure and connectivity shown by these stick figures or skeletal figures. Here's a, a typical amino acid. It's one of the 20 amino acids that goes into protein structures, asparagine. But this position here, this carbon, this methane carbon, can either be kinked downward or upward. That's a stereochemistry issue. Those are actually enantiomers of each other, with this one with the dash wedge and three dimensions going back, and this one with the solid wedge coming out. Those are actually different isomeric compounds, they're enantiomers. With this one here, the S form actually has a bitter taste. The R form here actually has a sweet taste. And we see a lot of these in nature and in different drugs. They're in antiomeric forms. Isomeric forms that are very similar, but because they have a stereocenter, uh, they have the possibility of existing as two uh, different chiral versions of that molecule. We'll get into that in a separate chapter coming up. Molecules of life, of course, you've heard about uh, these from biology class or, or your high school chemistry, or even in Gen Chem, we go over some of these topics. Amino acids, I showed you one uh, before there. Those are the individual building blocks that become polymerized. The polyamide versions are the proteins, hormones, structures, antibodies, and a lot of other things in biological tissues. Then we have the lipids, the nonpolar things that make the lipid bilayer membrane here, and other signaling type molecules. And there's a lot of things that have these hydrocarbon tails which are not water soluble. Then we have the carbohydrates, which are polyhydroxylated uh, compounds. The cyclic simple one here, glucose, and we'll talk about that mainly in 352. We'll use some of these examples here in 351, but in 352 we'll get into more of the details of these five major, four major categories of biological molecules, including DNA and RNA, the uh, coding molecules that have the sequence information to make the specific of proteins and other uh, molecules in living uh, tissues. But yeah, DNA, 
Uh, you've probably heard of that, that one more than any other, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a four-letter code, right? T, C, A, and G. Just different variations on the base at the one position. The deoxyribose, the sugar part, stays the same. But it's this double helix in the complementary hydrogen bonding pattern that's important that guards the code uh, for who you are <laughs> and what proteins are expressed in all the cells of your body. Uh, so it's kind of a neat thing to see the connection between the fundamental OCHEM structures and moving forward in biology. And that's kind of a goal for 352 to get you ready for uh, biochemistry later on. There's some more specific uh, amino acids. Uh, you'll learn all of those later. But you can see the polymerization here, the, the polyamides with the side chains just varying off there with the different amino acids. So that'll become more important uh, second semester. But this is the basics of, uh, of the structure there. Uh, the form and the function of these proteins is dependent on these organic amino acid uh, building blocks. Yeah, and this is just a little bit more about how we learn the structures about different uh, proteins and, and how they act in cells. Conformational freedom of how they adopt a shape that we can study by X-ray crystallography. Uh, that's kind of moving forward from Linus Pauling's basic ideas of the alpha helix that maybe you've heard about before. Steroids, uh, the hormones that uh, create different effects in the body. Everything from pregnancy, metabolism regulation, ovulation, uh, male growth characteristics. Uh, cholesterol itself is not a hormone. It's a constituent of the cell membranes. It has more of a mechanical function to keep uh, cell walls uh, fluid and uh, allow for the motions of different cells. Only a small amount of cholesterol is converted into these hormones. And you can see some... some uh, similarities among the structures, the four rings there, the A, B, C, and D ring, the three uh, six-membered rings, and the one five-membered ring on the end. But the functional groups change, and when they bind different receptors in the body, that's how they elicit their effects. So it's a strong connection to uh, biology and the basic uh, uh, processes that go on there differentiation of cells and uh, maturation, whatever. Vision, this is a great example of polyenes, which will be a, a chapter coming up here. Polyenes can exist in the cis or the trans form right there, and uh, light is actually harvested in the light bulb, the, the back of the eyeball and the retina there, specialized cells, cone and rod cells, which have a protein called opsin, which interacts covalently uh, with this uh, retinal or vitamin A molecule. Initially it's cis upon excitation with light. H nu stands for Planck's constant and then the frequency of the light. That's a picosecond event which excites the electrons in that pi bond, allows for rotation over to the more stable trans position. And that conformational change impacts upon the optical nerve. There's a G-coupled protein event, which involves some more steps there. And then that signal goes into your brain, and your brain creates the image that you actually see. So this is a fundamental uh, sensory process, of course, where we know a lot about the individual steps on the organic chemistry, and we don't know much about how the brain actually uh, creates that image that you see uh, in, inside uh, to sense what's on the outside there. But it's based on vitamin A, which we get from carrots and other sources when the food is considered a vitamin in that uh, regard. Synthesis is actually how we make compounds. You'll take the Chemistry 353 lab later on with Dr. Bronson. And, and this is really the second level of understanding of OCHEM. After structure, now we have reactivity. Putting compounds together, either with a reagent or a couple substrates to make a new product C. We can monitor that specifically using some simple techniques, uh, but then we use uh, spectroscopy. And in this class, we'll learn NMR, IR, and mass spec. We'll do some fundamentals with simple compounds, and you'll see how those different techniques work. Of course, we have to purify things and separate things out. We'll mention that from time to time. But we'll show you the spectroscopy and how the uh, we can characterize and see exactly what structure we have. Of course, it's based on a lot of history. This goes back a couple hundred years. And uh, the people that have done key experiments here, the first one to make a naturally occurring molecule, urea, synthetically, was uh, Wohler. 
Uh, Colby also made a naturally occurring compound acetic acid synthetically there. Uh, Perkin uh, tried to make quinine, but instead by accident he made mauve, this intensely purple compound. He started the dye industry from that, and, and scientists started using these dyes to stain different microorganisms, including bacteria, and they noticed some dyes could actually selectively kill different bacteria, and that started the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, I'll mention some of the history about that. But being able to separate compounds, a typical cell in biology will have hundreds or even thousands of different individual compounds. Being able to use chromatography allows us to separate different uh, materials, and to sweat started with plant pigments which you could actually see eluding down a chromatography column. We use those techniques, of course, to separate things out carefully now. So here's a modern uh, molecule, also Tamavir or Tamiflu, a very potent antiviral compound developed to counteract the effects of bird flu. If you take it within 48 hours of contracting that viral infection, you'll be cured, or, or most people will. I think it's 90% effective. Maybe some of you have taken it, but it requires 12 steps to make it. This Diels Alder reaction starts things off to make the cyclohexene. We'll talk about Diels Alder reactions, but then a lot of functionality needs to go on. And then finally, it's this uh, hydrolysis or the, or the salt form. Yeah, hydrolyzing the Bach group and then putting on the ammonium cation there. So it's that phosphate salt that's the actual drug. And you can see the different functional groups, but that uh, uh, needs to be done to make uh, the drug and how it acts, and maybe we'll mention some of that uh, later on. Uh, glycolysis in 352, we'll go, go over this, the conversion of glucose into pyruvate, uh, which is a process in the cells to create, what, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy molecule inside cells. Glucose is, of course, blood sugar. It circulates inside the body and is taken up by the different cells and then is oxidized onto pyruvate to make that. We'll cover those individual steps, like I said, in 352. Some of the principles, of course, carry over in reactivity here from 351. And then the citric acid cycle, also uh, the conversion of acetyl-CoA, which is an acetate, onto CO2 and water. Um, those are the combustion materials, right? Carbon dioxide and water. Uh, essentially, you're converting it in the presence of oxygen into those fully oxidized things. And you're making along the way molecules of ATP. So we'll show you how energy is uh, converted, interconverted within cells and how it works that way. So OCHEM, you know, is a broad area of interest, a lot of different uh, applications of it, including things like explosive materials. Maybe I'll mention some of that later. Drugs certainly will come up, petroleum, energy, paints and dyes, plastic, food, of course, uh, organic compounds, herbicides, pesticides, and many others, actually. That's just uh, the, the, the major areas. Biological chemistry studies the specifics of these uh, different subclasses of, uh, of compounds with repeating structures like the polyamides uh, in proteins, the polynucleic acids, A, T, G, and C, and DNA and RNA and then the carbohydrates and the lipids, like I mentioned there. Analytical chemistry, yeah, we will learn some of that, uh, including spectroscopy, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and mass spectrometry, and a little bit on IR as well. So, yeah, hopefully that gives you a little intro into what OCHEM is and, and why it might be useful to be studied. Uh, be thinking about that the first day, we'll, we'll start talking about that. But again, this is how you want to look, right? At the beginning of the semester, you look this way. You all look sharp. But at the end of the semester, after we go through the course, how are you going to look? Well, you'll stay nice if you're doing these things, right? You're going to be dressed for success. But if you start <clears throat> skipping uh, these good habits, leave things out, <clears throat> do things late, don't study enough, <clears throat> you're going to have some problems there you're gonna wind up looking like I do at the end of each semester, so don't do that. So here's the main idea about chemistry, I think. Hopefully there's enough space in your brain to cram some of this information in there. And so let's see, what's the first thing on your mind when you think about kind of structure? How does carbon with four valence electrons come together 
to create all these different structures, these chains, these rings, these functional groups. That's going to be on your mind. That's the first level of understanding. Everything goes back to structure. The next idea is reactivity. If you combine it with a reagent and do some sort of reaction here, you create a new molecule C. And what is that new structure there? And what was it about the reagents that did that transformation? So first day, I'll show you some simple transformations. And maybe you've heard of some already. But reactivity. Ochem's not static. It's dynamic. We're creating new compounds here. And then the next <coughs> level of understanding, <coughs> mechanism. How does this reactivity idea work? How do we get to C? <coughs> well, it's going to be following the electrons. Where the electrons start, like on a lone pair or in a pi bond, and they fill into an empty orbital somewhere else in the system. So we'll see how those reagents work in the flow of electrons. Electron pushing uh, diagrams will become important to fully understand reactivity. So yeah, you'll be tested and focused on these three ideas. And, and think about these ideas, this hierarchy of understanding as we go through each chapter. There'll be some commonality there, I think, as we go through that. And so uh, yeah, if you've got these three things straight, you should be uh, OK there. Now, recommended study time. So the recommendation in our department is uh, two to three hours spent studying for every uh, hour in class. And you know, you, I talk to successful people, and they'll go up to four or even five hours a day for every uh, hour spent in class. So we have three hours each week. So what does that come out to be? Six to, uh, what, nine hours a week you need to be studying? Or maybe even 10 or 12 hours a week. So this is like a part-time job, having the time and the commitment to be able to read the chapters carefully, review your notes from class, and work enough problems to keep things straight. But if you do that, you should be fine. <clears throat> now, hopefully that answers most of your questions there. For the syllabus, like I said, go into Learning Suite and see the detailed schedule. Look under contents and you'll see a button there that'll show you uh, where to get a PDF version, version of the schedule and the syllabus. And we'll see you on the first day of class. Very good, thank you.